Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Let's Debate. You put forward hot takes about literature, fantasy, YouTube, my channel, what have you, and I respond to them here and do disagree or agree, and we kind of get into a little debate if I disagree. Pips just sat on me for like 20 minutes. I wanted to start this video earlier, but I was not going to make him get up. Let's get into the first debate. Stop reading the same stories. Stop giving us remakes of all the same comic books and fairy tales and things we've seen five billion times and all kinds of different stories. Editors, publishers, and producers need to stop looking at those and seeing dollar signs and see them for what they are. Oversaturated and overused. I don't need another Batman story. I don't know if that is unpopular, but it drives me insane. It's certainly not unpopular to say online. We do see a lot of people saying the same sentiment throughout the interwebs, but unfortunately we're in a market driven entertainment economy and I'm sorry but those formulas like it or not I'm sure I'm tired of some of these formulas drive in stacks of cash and if you're a studio who's competing with tons of other studios you want those big blockbuster hits and every time a studio is willing to experiment with an annihilation recently it seems they're punished for it so I'm on your side I'd like to see more you know get outs I'd like to see more uh, oh what's that other really good sci-fi movie I'm trying to think of um Ex Machina's, but those don't bring in the dollars as some others do. We've even seen some experimentation with elements that usually leave these more formulaic stuff, like Invisible Man was a great retake on a super-powered individual story where it just was like telling the story of abuse. I'd love to see like MCU DC to go in that direction. DC seems to be more willing to right now. MCU is very comfortable in their formula. And while I still like the MCU, I do see them going to eventually have diminishing returns. Let's hope this next phase they do take your advice here and uh, get a bit wild and weird. But no, I don't think this is necessarily an unpopular opinion, so shame! Shame for a not unpopular opinion. How dare you? How dare you? Juniper books are way overpriced for nearly half the price of just their jackets. Folio Society, that's not true. Folio Society offer the same full custom-made book. Even the leather-bound editions of the Cosmere books are cheaper. Outrageous prices. You've exaggerated here a bit, but I think Juniper Books is trying to satisfy a very niche thing where people want special editions, but also jackets that are tougher. Uh, that's one of their big selling points is like their jackets are more tear-proof. I think they have more claims on top of them as well. Folio Society also has some very expensive ones. It kind of depends on the specific series, the licensing deal they have. I mean, it's going to vary because they're, they're kind of acting as a middleman to provide you a special edition of a product that someone else is making but I do think you know juniper price is rather expensive but no one's making you buy them and on top of that again this is like a market driven thing why is this turning into capitalism the fantasy show I don't know but I mean if they needed to lower the price I'm sure they would but they're got to be making decent enough sales I rarely see them kind of marking stuff down or anything so seems to be working for them but I don't know, maybe we'll see them cheaper in the future. We need more whole, well-adjusted families in fiction. We don't always have to have deceased parents slash siblings or broken homes to add depth to a story. I come from a two-parent stable home and I still have plenty of flaws and make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I like the self-awareness. It's gotten to be a cliche almost, and it's, it is a cliche, no doubt, and is frequently the reason for a character being who or what they are. So this is like low-hanging fruit, right? Authors have low-hanging fruit to start drama or a point of conflict, so they reach for it. I disagree with your sentiment in a way where I actually like having representation for different formats of families. Uh, I do think there are still plenty of stories out there that have, a, you know, whole families being the backing setting for characters, usually sidekicks and stuff, uh, but, you know, maybe a little bit more for main characters to be nice. But I actually encourage the representation of different styles of family as someone who comes from a home of divorce and having a parent in the LBGTQ plus community, I dream of the day where I can see my exact setup where I have brothers and stepsisters and, you know, a dad over here and moms over there in a book. That'd be really cool. What I'm going to agree with you with, and I actually think might be more of a motivating factor for this comment than you may know, is to stop representing these things as bad. Uh, not every divorce ends horribly. Sometimes people just fall out of love and it's amicable. Not every time someone is dead is everyone not 
got over it and it's destroyed the family. Sometimes people heal together and can even be brought closer due to loss. That kind of stuff I'd like to see more of. And I'm pretty sure the original commenter of this would agree. It's not about like, oh, I just want this blatant family equation that I like and makes me comfortable. It's about showing not all these things as awful and terrible. Sometimes like, you know, people grow together, people change together and they can evolve and it still be a wholesome setting. But then again, that doesn't provide a whole lot of drama fuel uh, for an author. So, you know, there's that. I feel like the authors should rewrite bad books in a series without shame. If book two in a series is weak, it's fine to rewrite and re-release. Just make sure the old version is still available. Wow. Oh, God, that hurts to read because I disagree, but you're not wrong. This is a matter of opinion. I, I believe once art is art, it's out. You can't go back and take to a canvas. What you can do, I think, um, maybe you and I can agree with, let's say you have a book, your sequel's hated, it's horrible, do a decanon and put out a different one. Don't rewrite that book, or maybe do in a way, but I, I think because you're not saying, yeah, because you're saying the old version's still available, I can say I agree, but it also feels a bit wrong to me. I don't know why, it shouldn't, but there's just a part of me that I want to read that's like, ah. Oh impure but maybe i'm just like a snob i'm not sure this i am conflicted about this 547 people agreed with you i thought that'd be more controversial i'm having trouble digesting it the idea that there needs to be an individual antagonist within literature has hurt the dystopian genre more than any other trope the whole point of dystopia is that the antagonist is the all-encompassing state they are everywhere always watching, always planning. And by tight and by trying to focus on one individual within the government and have them be the villain, it takes away from the fact that they are just one cog in the machine. 1984 does this perfectly by not having William worry about any one individual within the party, but rather the party as a whole. I, I'm going to disagree with the 235 people who uh, upvoted this. I think there are still plenty of dystopias being written now that uh, lean into this, at least that I've come across. And I'm not going to push against an author who wants to do different in dystopia and say, no, there's like a supreme leader who's the enemy. And this dystopia has this problem that we need to tackle and take down. And if we do this one person, it will fall. Because that's also kind of a fairly accurate representation. Many empires and kingdoms have fallen rapidly once their one figurehead or quote-unquote real-life antagonist has fallen. Uh, so I, I, I disagree a little bit because I think as long as both have their healthy livelihood and from what I've seen they do, it's okay to go either direction. There should be more depictions of familial love and fantasy. It would be nice if authors depicted a sibling sibling. Yeah, I think this kind of falls into what I was saying before. Uh, because while authors usually can't pull off good romance, I believe a sibling relationship would be easier slash more realistic and definitely a fresh breath of air. Do you want to go outside, Pips? Here. There you go. Cool. Cool. Or turn and bite my foot. That's cool, too. Do you want to go or do you want to bite my foot? There's two options here. You want to go. Okay. Um, I, the only aspect of this I disagree with is that these things need to be mutually exclusive. Um, you know, it seems like you're kind of putting it forward as like, don't do a romance, do familial. I think both is fine. I just would like to generally see the, the line of familial brought up because I think that is actually resulted in some of the best friendships in fantasy. Seeing friendships between siblings or siblings that go from hating each other to loving each other, loving each other to hating each other. That's drama, man. Uh, so I, I kind of, I'm with you, but I don't want it to like, don't, it's not, it's not don't do, it's not don't do romance. It's just, you know, also do familial stuff. Just don't cross that line. What's with all the incest recently? Just stop romancing your siblings, you freak. Realistic doesn't mean grimdark. Realistic means actions have consequences, roughly proportional to themselves. There's parts of reality that are grimdark. There's also parts that are completely noble bright. Even in situations that are grimdark, there's people that will insist it's the opposite. Basically, reality is a mix of dark and light. We should treat it as such. Again, this is something I think if you ask most people, they would agree with you on. There's just one contingent that's pretty vocal who always says like, grimdark means real. And even those people, if you push back, you're like, no, Reality's not grimdark. I had a good day today. I ate some Cheetos. I had a good poo and then I napped. They'll be like, oh, you're right. That's cool. But you know, sometimes it's grimdark. So this is like a point that's like, it's nice to say, 
but I don't think many people actually disagree with you, despite the fact that you will see people saying stuff because they just aren't thinking through what they're saying, uh, disagreeing with you in a way. But if you push back, they'll agree with you because there's very few people out there who are like, everything is awful. Books that have explicit content should be labeled as such, like movies are. It's funny, as someone who doesn't believe in censorship at all and totally believes that authors should be able to write whatever they want, I also completely agree with this statement. It's kind of crazy that we only have have things broken down for like kids, teens, adults, and we don't have any warning for adults on the book or anywhere that's like, by the way, this contains the most graphic stuff ever. It's why you constantly have people who are picking up books that like really affect them and they didn't like agree to enjoy that kind of content. Like Stephen King's uh, The li Librarian Policeman, li whatever that's called, that should have a warning. That should have a very big warning that's like, hey, if certain kinds of horrible adult things bother you, don't pick this one up. Because hey, not every adult just wants to go read that all the time or ever, and that's okay. We should have some form of warning system. I'm not saying like we should relegate books over to a certain side, just maybe like on the inside flap, a small panel that's like, contains these things might bug you. Cause it's crazy to me that like that could be next to Kings of the Wild on the shelf and everyone's just like, yeah, those are, those are the same. No warning whatsoever in the difference between those two. Fantasy based on Indian mythology needs to be appreciated and criticized more. They've really come into their own with writers like Amish Trapathi, Trapathi? Tripathi, I think so. And even some writers from US. I agree, but I will give a little bit of defense here for my fellow critics. I've looked into picking up several fantasy books based on Indian mythology, and I want to find ones that were written by Indian authors and you know were translated over here. But very often when I'm about to pick them up, I find, oh no, the translation's terrible, totally ruined it. And a lot of people saying that, so then I get nervous. I'm like, I don't. I don't want to read something that's been ruined by a translation. What should I do? Like, it's kind of like, ah, damn it. Cause that's happened to me three times now, I think. So maybe I'll just do one that's written by an American who is of Indian heritage and was inspired by any mythology. I'm not sure. I'm still trying to do this. It's just like, there's, there's apparently some issue happening where the translations are being criticized by the original audience quite heavily. If Avatar creators leaving is due to Netflix making the show darker, then I'm all here for it. Give me vicious firebenders and brutal earthbenders. That's gonna be, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna be a divisive thing among the fans, man. They are not gonna be in United behind you. I'm not, there's gonna be some with you. Clearly you got 174 upvotes, but there's gonna be some mad at you too. I agree with you. I do, I flat out agree with you. I would like a more adult take on that story, especially coming into live action from animation. I think the humor from the animation especially will not translate and it'll look horrible in live action like it did in the movie to have someone slammed in the face with fire and not show how brutal and awful that would be. I agree with you. <sighs> but I also, you know, the fans want an adaptation of that original story and I'm not gonna tell them they're wrong. Yeah, but if there's many other reasons why the showrunners left, I still think it's a bad sign because we don't know for sure that's the reason. For all we know, they were down for that. It's just the fact that they left so dramatically is what kind of gives me a big oh, reaction to it. What most people call being inspired from historical cultures is mostly anachronism and pop culture perceptions of actual traditions and customs, etc. You see that all the time with European inspired settings. As a result, people come to the conclusion that European inspired settings are too boring and generic and whatnot. And I don't believe that. I think you can definitely write a unique and detailed setting that takes inspiration from various periods of European history. I just think authors need to do more research. You're right. Um, when most people, myself included, I'm not above this, I make this mistake all the time, say they're tired of, um, you know, European inspired fantasy. What they really mean is they're tired of English or maybe French inspired fantasy. I would love to see some fantasy inspired by like medieval Spain or, you know, medieval Russia. That would be pretty cool. But uh, what we really see is a lot of authors very obsessed with English history or more just, you know, the Eastern European side of things, excluding a lot of the Far Eastern side uh, and just kind of pulling from there. I I'm all down for going from different European countries and hyper focusing on interesting quirks of their culture and not just doing the English retelling. But yeah, maybe I should be more careful, but I'm probably gonna forget about it and not, but you make a good point. And I think a lot of people, when they say European inspired fantasy, what they really mean is they're getting tired of English inspired fantasy from like that one stretch of time everyone takes from. 90% of the writing advice videos on YouTube are garbage and are literally just there to make 
money by further distracting procrastinating writers with 181 upvotes. Whoa. So this, I stopped making writing advice videos because I got a lot of appreciation and positive comments on them, but I would also get messages from authors and people who write as well who are saying, hey, that works for you. It might be good advice for you. Probably doesn't work for a lot of people though as well and or is not a huge amount for certain audiences. And that's what kind of eventually made me want to stop. Also, Murphy Napier did not take the idea of, of Dear Authors from me. She just kind of coincidentally started doing a series called Dear Authors when I did and hers were just better. So I stopped doing my Dear Authors series um, so I know specifically what you're talking about though, because there are higher quality writing advice videos. I find Murphy appears to be quite good. And then there's a lot from smaller content creators or maybe even some larger ones that are pretty awful. Um, and they very much so are, here is how I do it. Therefore, here is how you should do it. And everyone who doesn't do it my way is bad. And that's not how the creative process works. So if you see someone doing that, probably give a dislike and unsub because they're not being very helpful and they're probably contributing to some people who want to be writers feeling very uh, helpless because they can't progress going down that system, but a creator they like and respect is telling them it's the only way to do it. And if they don't do it that way, it's wrong. They might be ruining someone's writing potential. So yeah, that's actually part of the reason why I stopped making writing advice videos. And just every now and then I'll kind of mention the fact that I believe in exploring all kinds of different strategies because there really is no one right answer to this. It's however it works for you. I've interviewed a lot of authors and asked them a ton of questions about their writing process and never gotten the same answer. Everyone's different. Um, I, I really respect the way Evan Winter writes. I mean, we talked and he plans out his story. I mean, he usually, I think he says like 200 pages of outlining uh, that he will like do before like going through the whole book or something crazy like that. I'm the complete opposite. I sit down, I maybe do a couple bullet points for the stuff I'm about to write, and then I go from there and I explore. There's no right answer. And a lot of these booktubers or author tubers, whatever the hell they call themselves, are doing a massive disservice when they tell people in very specific terms that theirs is the way to go. Um, I've seen multiple of even the big people do it and I just don't appreciate it, especially the ones who like have had some success. And so then they act like their success story is the path when it's not, it is for you, might not be for anybody else or very few percentage of people. This is not me doing a drama call out bull crap. I know how much drama booktubers occasionally like to have. This is my interpretation of a problem I have witnessed and had quite a bit of evidence on my side of damaging people's writing because they then feel like they need to write like you. It also goes into the whole relationship content creators have with their audiences where people view us in ways where it's like, oh, you're infallible. Everything you're telling me is perfect. When no, every content creator I've met is a good person. I've actually never met a content creator I did not like, but they're flawed individuals and many of them are self-taught, which means they're rather unorthodox in everything they do. So don't maybe take us as, you know, word of God. I feel these Let's Debate videos would be better if you chose a more specific topic every video, similar to Dear Authors from Murphy Napier. <laughs> it's, I started that type of video first, Murph. She took, it's fine. And she did not take the idea from me. That would prevent repetition and would encourage more detailed and precise opinions to be shared, which I prefer over the current format. Still enjoy your videos. Let's try that. Next one, we'll give a specific topic and we'll go from there. Hot take. While lying on one's back and holding their book above their face so as to see the words they are trying to read, one's comprehension goes down because of the exertion required to maintain the arm position. Also, it's more dangerous if one falls asleep. Their book can fall into their neck delivering the most deadly of paper cuts. It may not be as dangerous as Daniel's mic situation, hi, but still, um, hard disagree. As someone who loves sitting on their back, my arms are rested on the floor and I just have the book. It's not a whole lot of exertion force. I'm not even holding up a hardback. It's a paperback, so it weighs like nothing. This is, this is a, I don't know, is this, what is happening right now? I'm scared. The people that like full season drops are in serious need of some patience and are part of what's wrong with America. <laughs> no, they're not part of what's wrong with America. Maybe. Uh, no, they, okay. So these people have a different priority, right? They like to binge. They want to get the entertainment all at once and that's fine. The people who don't like full on drops, maybe even still would rather to binge, but they prioritize the discussion with the fan community, talking about it with the people, you know, they know in their life who are also watching it. And that's one other way to prioritize. I like that way because I have a lot of people I talk about these shows and movies and stuff with, and I want to be able to do that episode by episode. And if it all drops at once, 
that ain't gonna happen. So yeah, there's that. I also think your show is more likely to succeed if you do weekly. Like that just to me is absolutely the case. Uh, I've seen again and again, like there's obviously shows that drop all at once and do extremely well. Stranger Things did extraordinarily well, but that's also because it had a lot of factors that contributed to its success. Netflix marketed the crap out of it. It got crazy word of mouth just because of how different it was. Many reasons here. And it was just a great first season of television. I believe it would have done even better and the conversation would have lasted longer if they did a weekly episode drop for that season one. Uh, because it, we've seen so many times a show live or die on the online discussion. Game of Thrones, I'll say it here, would have been maybe a third as large if it didn't have the insane amount of online discussion it got in between episodes and even seasons. To be honest, most authors suck at writing sex scenes unless it's their job to write that stuff, i.e. authors of romance and erotic novels. And their writing would actually be better if they got rid of the sex. I think that George R. R. Martin is especially guilty of this. Like, I don't need the deep description of Tyrion's member and calling Sam's a fat pink mast or something. I don't know how hot that was, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of fantasy authors are really bad at writing sex. I've written my first sex scene, think I did a slightly better job than a lot of people. I don't know why there's this like prudish overtone that often like permeates a lot of fantasy authors attempts at writing sex where it's just like, can I write that? Oh, it's so dirty. I'm not gonna call it a titty. I'm gonna call it a jiggly mountain in the wind. Stop it, it's a titty. Call it a titty. I wish we let adult characters have these self-discovery moments. Every single YA is about a kid's figuring things out in life, but that implies everything is A-OK -okay as an adult, and it's not, LOL. Adults are still figuring out life, and that's OK. I can think of a, most books I read have adults doing self-discovery moments. I just had one that was huge in Jade War, which I'm currently reading. I also had another one recently in Fires of Vengeance. That's kind of like the theme of that book. Um, just a harsh disagree. I, I just disagree with this because I think there are plenty of adult having self-discovery moments. I don't know. Oh, or okay, I'm talking about like moral things. Are you talking about like discovering things about themselves as like a character, like, oh, gay, straight, things like that? Then yeah, then maybe, I'm not sure. This is just a little too vague for me to get 100% behind it yet. Need clarification, please. Including diversity in your story is not political. It can be if you make it, but yeah, I agree. In general, it's not. And the people who get upset every time they see anything of diversity in a book, they're the ones politicizing it. Um, authors have every right to say, you know what? There's black people in this village too, because it's my world and I created it that way. And it's just the way the genetics have happened. And that's just, they're able to do that. Um, I have chosen to justify it in my story because we're in a single conquered empire with a ton of trade and some rapidly advancing technologies, which results in a lot of diversity happening. Uh, but you don't have to. And if you don't, that's okay. If you just want to have diverse characters, awesome. Um, I don't understand people who get mad at that. But, you know, the internet's full of people who are going to be angry at stuff, no matter what. This has been your latest episode of Let's Debate, the show where you leave your hot takes, and in the next one, I'll be specific and ask for a hot take on a specific genre, setting, I don't know. Let me know your suggestions in the comments down below of what I should be asking for hot takes specifically on. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace!